Welcome to Art Salon. I'm Ellie Shore. I'm delighted to say hello to people here who I haven't seen in a long time. Meet new people. Uh, welcome. Um, one piece of housekeeping I wanted to let you know that usually the art salons are the first Tuesday of every month, but this year there's just been all kinds of things happening that got in the way. So the next art salon is October 30th, and that's so that you don't have to choose between coming here and voting, because voting is important. So pay attention to dates. It's not always the first Tuesday night. And with that, I'd like to introduce Philip Esland. We've been talking about his speaking here for quite two years, a, two years yeah. easily. And it was, yeah, I really want to do it, but I need some more time. And we finally got to tonight. I'm really happy about that. I know Philip since the early 2000s when we both were involved with the Palm Beach Institute for Contemporary Art. So we've known each other and I remember visiting him in his studio in West Palm Beach. And Philip at that time was doing absolutely beautiful and very unusual collages that were kind of a combination of suburbia and living in a house and having a garden and then weird things were happening. And there were just all of these calamities as I remember them. And they were small and meticulous and kind of magical. And they were often done on found pieces of metal, a refrigerator door, things that he had picked up from somewhere. Since then, <coughs> he's gotten way bigger and way more dramatic. And he'll be talking to you about the work that he does. Um, it's always based on climate events, hurricanes, major storms, and then also financial crises and financial, he says financial climate, using all kinds of thrown away materials and blown away materials and damaged materials. Philip has a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the Maryland Institute and also had course study work in Holland and has been really well known in this area and also has shown his work in New York and in a lot of other places. He won the South Florida Consortium grant in 2011 and he's represented by the Gavlak Gallery in Palm Beach. And he's been working for the last three years at the bunker and for Beth Rudin DeWoody creating the space for the bunker, curating the artwork. He was one of three co-curators. Philip Esland. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. I really appreciate that. And um, the trip down memory lane, the Palm Beach ICA. How many, how many remember the ICA? Yeah, it was a really special place. It was an old, um, the old Art Deco Theater. I think it was built in 19... 28 and uh, iconic deco structure in um, Lake Worth that's now where the Cultural Council is and we had a um, incredible run it was five years Bob and Mary Montgomery funded the institution and I was brought in at the halfway point and it was a non-collecting institution a Kunst Hall which was a very rare format for an institution these days to be non-collecting and we had inherited the space from, um, it had been a couple of different you know, university galleries, but it's, its original use as a museum was from the Lannan Foundation. And J. Patrick Lannan had an incredibly eclectic collection. He was really democratic with who came and saw it, so he would have busloads of school kids come over to the island, and the island got kind of tired of that much traffic on his street, and so, he ended up buying the, uh, the museum and, and, and the Montgomery's allowed us to do exhibitions. They weren't at all interested in contemporary art. They had no skin in that game at all, but they, they did a bit of a survey to find out what uh, Palm Beach County needed overall. And they were more involved with the Kravitz and with the Armory and other, other places. And we had free reign to do these amazing exhibitions for five years. but. There were issues with foot traffic, and you know we, we were the type of place that got major reviews in Art Forum and Art in America, 
but on a weekend, we'd sometimes get 12 people coming through. So it was this catch-22. But I, I'd really love to establish another place like that. It brought a lot of interesting people together. And that is how Ellie and I got to know, and Jerry and I got to know each other. And uh, she had mentioned the collages and the, I'm just giving you a little backstory before I get into the slides because I don't have, I'm not talking in this presentation about this early work, but just to give you a little background and how that flowed into what Ellie was describing. You know, I was, my oldest daughter is now 18, but when she was a toddler, I had taken a couple of years break from making work, you know, because I had some bills to pay and we were moving from Baltimore to, to Miami. It was the first time I hadn't had a studio in a while, so I got into making collages because the best space available for me was the kitchen table. I started cutting up National Geographics and magazines and making these collages. I saw them as storyboarding ideas that could go macro at some point. So they were all paper-based pieces, small in scale, and Ellie remembers that I had started doing them on found metal with you know a lot of character to them like dripping rust marks and wood grain and then I would integrate the imagery into the surface and there was like a spatial interaction there and the imagery became less and less and the material kind of started speaking more and more and at the time I had a, a studio in Lake Worth on the railroad tracks at 3rd and G Street it was an amazing building and I had a good friend who started coming around and then he sort of never left. He lived in the neighborhood, but I'm like, why is, why is this character never going home? And I realized he collected a lot of stuff. His house might have been filled with a lot of stuff. And he started bringing stuff to my place. And, and one day I was pulling all of these refrigerator doors and air conditioned panels and putting them in my truck. And I was like, I'm getting rid of all this stuff. And I looked down at the surface and I had an epiphany. I was like, wow. He's understanding a part of my visual language that I'm not, or maybe this is just a happy accident. So I unloaded my truck <laughs> of all this stuff and I isolated sections of these panels. And that's how those collages started. But that, that language of found material has always been my thing. You know, I, I, felt, I felt close to making work on paper, but I wasn't that invested. I, it wasn't the material connection that I'd been used to, to uh, exploring. So those very tactile, physical, surface-oriented collages segued me into making things three-dimensional again. I'd always, in college and a little bit beyond, made three-dimensional work. But that got me into this language of three-dimensional found materials. So that's kind of an intro to where I got to this point. And this point is a series of sculptures that I made between 2006 in 2011, they were all in response to hurricanes, the, the big hurricanes we had in 2005 and 6. There was like Wilma and Rita and Jean, that whole series where, you know, really was devastating to the area. And the area around my studio and other places, but my studio in particular, there were small cottages built in the 20s and a lot of the siding had come off of them roofs were off, tarps on everything, and sometimes the tarps just kind of like deteriorated into this kind of blue mulch that, you know, if they didn't get their roofs fixed quickly enough. Me and my buddy, Raphael, who, as you know, had a thing for collecting, we would just hoard fence posts and fence siding and house siding and Venetian blinds and roof tar and categorize and stack it. and so. You know, I'm, I'm using a lot of found materials to address the specific time in a specific place. And following that, on the heels of that, we had this real estate bubble, which was the time that I bought my studio, which was a very bad time to buy. I ended up having to give that back to the bank. But, you know, the bubble expanded and it burst, as all bubbles do. And so a lot of my pieces from this time were I titled them after like real estate terminology. This one is called Fixer Upper. And they became a bit anthropomorphic and had these kind of personalities to them in a way. So to me, they became kind of these architectural bodies in, in a way. So I have a few still images of these that I'll talk about. And then there's a, there's a video, it's an interview with me during a show that I did at um, the Hollywood Art and Culture Center. It was called Subprime Subtropics. 
and that was based on a title of a piece that I'd done. And this, this talk is called Derelict Nature, which is Ellie thought was a good idea because it was a show that I did at one point. So I have, I, using a lot of language around these pieces too that reflect the work. This one is called um, Re-Roof. And um, you know, again, every, everything that I, you know, including the, the material that I make the rafters with, it's all stuff that I source from those hurricanes. And I would, I would mill it down on the table saw and make it dimensionally accurate. And um, the How big is that accurate? Yeah. Oh, good question, good question. So the, the next one gives you a little bit better scale, but that one was probably four feet tall. Thank you. So two to four feet is the scale of this group. The third one is a little bit bigger. So, you know, all of these strips here, you know, are, are ripped down and, and you know, it's essentially like a model making. And uh, the next one is, um, there are two slides of this one. This is called Down In It. These images are from a show in LA I did at Acme Gallery in 2012. And um, this is the one that I used, the metal Venetian blinds that I found as siding. So I found these old rusty Venetian blinds and, and they had the same language and same scale as, as siding on the houses that were in my environment. And the, I use, use materials very democratically, um, cardboard, glue, two-part urethane foam, stuff that you would get at Home Depot or house paint, you know, <coughs> finding house paint. And so this piece will refer to the larger piece that Ellie was speaking about. This is the first one that I did that was off of the wall. It was on the floor coming out of the ground and started getting away from, not, not away from, but started getting a bit more into sea level rise and, and thinking about our environment as the uh, water level changes over the course of time. The next slide is a, a, these landscape pieces. Now this one is, is much bigger. It's a nine feet wide by six feet tall. And this one is called Stygian Sunrise. And the word Stygian is derivative from the river Styx. And it just, it's become a word that just connotes like extreme darkness or gloom. And I, I did this piece after a little bit of break from making work, but right on the heels of the BP oil spill. Kind of had a, a real psychic toll on me, the BP oil spill did. Being in Florida, I, I, I really, something didn't feel right about that event. And um, you know, it just went on for so long and it was just on TV. It was like watching the Twin Towers come down. You're just watching this geyser from a well, you know, day after day. And it just seemed like it could have been controlled way earlier. And they treated it with this stuff called Corexit, which was, it, it only diluted and dispersed the material further and further away. And, it didn't really change it on a chemical level at all. Basically what it did was it made the oil on the surface, which was visible, sink. sink. Right. So that it looked like it was all It was pretty. Good. Yeah. And then we all saw that oil slicked, you know, <clears throat> wildlife and animal life and the cleanup effort. And, um, you know, so um, this was my response to that. You know, the, the material on the right-hand side is two-part rubber and there's a mulch that I made and there's oil in this piece and um, again house paint and I, I used this delaminating piece of plywood that I found that became you know very kind of spatial and landscape and then the vertical elements on the front which kind of indicate um, trees or a dock down or something like that Th those are held off and suspended in front of the piece like from a foot back to nothing. So there's a real spatial physicality to these pieces. And I think this is the first where I got away from, you know, out of the series, I got away from just pure sculpture and got into like the spatial landscapes. And this one is called um, Landing Field Nether Valley. And so the I was reintroducing the houses in a way, kind of an indication of the houses. I saw them as birds kind of flying into the landscape in a way. And uh, the proportions are about the same as the other piece. 
It's about eight feet wide by six feet tall. But the way I make these is, you know, all of the busy, the busy stuff on the bottom is, um, you know, I mix up real mulch and sweepings from my studio, from other pieces, and I save buckets of, you know, different sized chips and, and then mix it with two-part urethane foam and then just pour it on and use gloves and kind of push it in and see what happens and then throwing house paint at this thing for a week and then washing it off with water and seeing what, what sticks and what doesn't and then just keep kind of building on it to give it that spatial Florida sky quality. And um, like these people, it's, it's impossible to sit, like know when to end making these things. You know, all the artists in here know that dilemma. It's like, when are you done with a piece? And the one before this one, before I put any paint on that, I had it in my studio and I was about to throw this thing away. I was so sick of looking at it. And a friend of mine came and encouraged me to keep it and keep at it. But that's just the stuff we go through. You know, you, you think that it's unsalvageable and um, it's, it's a good exercise to get fresh eyes on the work. This one is, is um, six feet tall and um, it's called Disaster Solutions, which a friend of mine who had gone to the Gulf to clean up the uh, oil spill, he, he, had, he came back and he had a t-shirt on that said Disaster Solutions on it. That was the name of a company that was hired to, to clean up part of the Gulf. So I thought that was appropriate because this guy vacuuming the landscape is like, there's no solution. It's, it's pretty futile, his, his task. The house sculptures are an ongoing series. I feel like I'm getting close to the end of. I started doing these pieces out of recycled material. The, the first ones were, I thought, gonna be maquettes, um, made of cardboard, and they ended up being sculptures on their own. Maybe six, seven years ago, I started salvaging material from uh, houses that had been damaged you know, siding, fences, that kind of thing. Milling it down, reappropriating, making smaller versions of those houses. So my direct response to the hurricanes was to make these houses that looked like they'd been subject to some natural force. Simultaneously, what was happening was that the housing market bubble was starting to burst. So many of the titles of the pieces reflect real estate terminology where houses are being reclaimed by banks and at once being reclaimed by nature. So I'm addressing both the economic bubble and burst at the same time that South Florida is recovering from natural disasters that crippled the economy here as well. I started referring specifically to houses in the area that my studio is in, where they're more cottage or trailers or vulnerable structures that felt like they don't have a sense of permanence in the first place. Progressively, they've gotten away from being scaled and specific, taking on almost anthropomorphic associations and forced perspectives that are beyond um, working at, as a scale model. So they become very object oriented and also appear that they're bursting out of the wall. They could possibly be a remnant, but at the same time, you're seeing it as a sculpture. This sculpture is called Conjoined, a Total Loss. It refers to post-hurricane housing conditions in South Florida, specifically in the area of my studio in Lake Worth, where a lot of the cottages and trailers have been subject to severe or partial damage, but uninhabitable. And what I've done here is conjoined two architectural bodies into one where they're impacting one another and they're permanently conjoined. And total loss refers to insurance terminology, a structure that is beyond repair. I feel that this piece takes on an anthropomorphic form. Conjoined refers to a relationship, a bodily relationship that makes it relatable to the body and to architecture. And is a believable condition following a natural disaster. The piece is made exclusively out of found materials, much of which were salvaged after the hurricanes. I used Venetian blinds as siding, as vinyl siding, and I 
devised a way to replicate a shredded tarp, which was so common at the time, even up to a year or two after the hurricanes, you'd see these roofs with shredded blue tarps. It almost looked like a skin. So in that sculpture in particular, I replicated the tarp by using blue foam and acetone, which dissolves it into like a skin and acts very much like burned flesh and uh, reads also very much like the torn tarps that were so common. What I hope that people walk away with is that decay is a beautiful thing and that all beautiful things decay. I hadn't seen that in a while. It's pretty good. So yeah, so that, that kind of ends that group of pieces that I do. I, I still revisit those houses sometimes but that's a good synopsis of what that period from 06 to 11 was about for me. And um, fast forwarding to now, you know, Ellie had come and seen a, a piece of mine that I'd done at the uh, Culture Lab this summer. It's the old Macy's space down in City Place and um, big retail is another issue these days. It's like, what are you gonna fill these big retail spaces? They've already got an Ellie Fitness. You're not gonna put another one there and that's what's taking over bookstores and big retail. And, so they thought of this solution to work with a group in New York called Culture Lab, or Culture Core, excuse me. And um, Doreen and Yvonne used to also have the uh, Artist Production Fund, so they'd work with artists to produce large-scale pieces. Um, so they approached them and had them do this exhibition called Assemblage, and it's open through uh, December at least, but maybe, maybe beyond. So they invited me to come. They'd seen some of my sculptures and they invited me to come check out the space. And then um, I, I, I went and I looked around this like old retail space and I was like, you know, these are gonna be a little anemic in this big weird kind of space. They're like way out of context here. Some of the pieces were already there. This is a uh, Jennifer Steinkamp piece. It's, these, it's a video projection piece of these like pearls going back and forth. And, I'm not sure, but I, I want to think that was the old jewelry department. And so there were a few, the place was kind of peppered with, with artwork and they're progressively building this exhibition. And, you know, I just, I felt really wrong about just bringing a few small pieces and putting them on the wall. So I pitched an idea to them, you know, I, I did some site shots and measured out the space and there, there was a piece that I'd been wanting to do for um, quite a while which involved a full-size pickup truck. I'd drawn this idea out a couple of years ago as a proposal for a museum up in Central Florida and it had a little bit of a different idea but this was a perfect opportunity to present the piece. So this is a photoshopped proposal of, of a full-size truck coming out of the ground and with all the contents kind of strewn behind it also coming out of the ground. I'd originally wanted to do this as a kind of a swamp piece where it was in a gallery space, but there's all these cypress knees coming out behind it, trailing off and you know, various levels of uh, submersion. And then also kind of like barnacles taking over the, the vehicle as well. So I did the uh, capitalist version of that and <laughs> had all of these kind of pieces coming out of the back of it and I turned it into a scrapper's truck like he was caught in the swamp or emerging from the swamp or whatever it might be. So I pitched this idea, they liked it and we, we negotiated the terms on me producing the piece and so I went and bought a uh, 1981 Silverado which I've, I love this truck and I hated the idea of cutting it in half. But, um, and when I got there, the guy apologized. He's like, yeah, it's, it doesn't have an engine. And I said, that's perfect. I don't want it to have an engine. I was gonna pull the engine, I was gonna pull the transmission, the drive, sh all, all the, the heavy non-essential stuff. So half of that was done for me. Then I, 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 I logistically was trying to figure out how, to, what, am I, what am I gonna do here? I, you know, I'm not gonna do it in, in a warehouse space or, um, so one of my friends is a, he has a marine construction company and a big yard down in Lantana. And I worked with a couple of his guys cutting this baby apart. So I, you know, I popped some chalk lines on the side of it and visualized how I would want it to lay. And um, we just all took turns with a 14 inch concrete saw. 
with a metal blade on it. And that was fun. That was the easy part, cutting the outer body of it. And then we, we torched the, the back axle and all the big stuff and torched the chassis and, and then just be grinding it. And then that's it, laying in the field. So I was pretty happy the minute we touched it down and I thought maybe I should just do this as an outdoor piece. Um, and I was nervous as to how good my cuts were, you know, because when you put it on a nice floor, there's like every little, yeah, irregularity is pretty apparent. So I didn't, I didn't have a title for this piece even after the installation of it and I usually research a lot of um, language around what I was thinking during making the work. And, and this is the most straightforward title I ever did for a piece. It's called Like a, like a Rock. It's the, the, the Chevy Silverado kind of catchphrase. And you know, it's got all these connotations. And in our case here, it's sinking like a rock, um, which is also you know, kind of um, reflective of the times we're in. So, so these are a lot of process shots. Um, it was quite a feat getting it into the building. I thought their bay door was going to be the right way to get it in, but there were a lot of obstacles on the way, so we had to get creative. And uh, we ended up rigging this and turning it on its side to get it inside the building through a pedestrian door. So this is, you know, we strapped a dolly to the front wheel and we're getting ready to lift it up. And there we go, we've got it up. I got, you know, Mike Carey's marine construction guys, a bunch of my friends, and we did it late at night so that no security was around. You know, so we'd have no eyes on us. They knew it was going to happen, but I just didn't want the pressure. That's the back view, and this is us getting it through the door with inches to spare. So, you know, it would touch down on a corner, you'd throw a blanket and drag, and, you know, it was, it was fun. It was nerve-wracking. So that's getting, his, getting it back down. That's Mike on the left side. He built, he builds massive build. He built the Faena down in Miami. He does a lot of subterranean, subaquatic construction. And so this was just fun for him. And then um, that's my buddy. He likes low riders. He wanted me to get that <laughs> shot. So we, you know, we placed it. You know, you see my tape measure up there. I was like scaling it to the proposal. And I just wanted the trajectory to be just right, because once it was down, it was down. And then everyone would go home. But then I was there for another week doing the detailing and, and had a lot of people helping me with this. The next um, video is my friend Danny Gomez was there that night. I didn't realize he was videotaping this whole thing. And he put together a little uh, video of us getting this piece in place through the building. So that was that, yeah. Um, and then, you know, some more process shots. We were to take care of that irregular line. We bondoed it, you know, to the floor, essentially, to, to really make it crisp and, and believable that it was emerging out of the ground. Um, oh, that's my, my main assistant, Daryl, and that's my daughter, Gabriella. And they did quite a bit of <coughs> faux finishing to make it look believable. And you know, I filled it with contents of things I'd found you know, over the course of weeks and things I already had. And you know, I found this like two weeks 
before driving my baby daughter around trying to get her to take a nap and I was like, wow, that's a cool cooler. And, um, and then this wastebasket I'd had for 12 years, but um, it needed to go. So we cut it all down to make it look like it was emerging out of the ground behind the, the piece. And so this is the finished piece um, with the Jennifer Steinkamp active in the background. And um, all of these ladders and doors and lawn mowers and TVs and shopping carts. And um, you know, we cut them all down on site with grinders and, and uh, lasers. And the, the narrative behind it is up for discussion. But um, this was the vision I had, and, and uh, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. Where is it now? So it's at the Culture Lab, which is the old Macy's in City Place. It's supposed to be open every Thursday through Sunday, noon to 6, and it's free, open to the public. So the, what, the reason this, this piece popped in my head, why it was fresh in my mind, because I'd already had the idea, was um, about three weeks before they asked me to propose or to be involved in any way. I was, um, I, my truck, which is not like, it's a newer truck, I was caught in the sand. And so the day after that, Trump made the comment about Haiti being a shithole. You know, I was in Northwood, right across from like Tina's and that area, the, the convenience stores. And I tried digging my way out of there like, you know, two hours. I was like putting two by fours, digging, and nothing was happening. No one was stopping. And this guy circled back, and he had a, a sprinter truck, and it was this Haitian guy. And he, he's like, oh, yeah, this happened to me a long time ago. I had, um, you know, I was trying from like six o'clock till midnight to get myself out, and I decided I had to go get a rope. And so he went, he walked like a mile away, bought a rope at a Walmart, came back, and it was the same rope he had from 23 years ago that he, because he had this rope, you know, he kind of flagged someone down to pull him out. But he still had the rope, and um, another guy saw what we were doing and, and came and helped. And, and um, so, you know, we got it out, and we had this really good discussion about, you know, just being human beings, helping one another out. And... Um, no one brought up Haiti being a shithole. Um, none of that sort of language came out, but it, um, the timing of it was, was interesting for me, and it uh, reignited me wanting to make this piece. So that is how this happened, and um, that's the last image. So, thank you.